Friday, January 13th, 2012. Cruise ship Costa Concordia strikes rocks off the coast of Italy. We're going to drown in here. There is no way out. Passengers struggle to escape the sinking ship. Everybody else just started trampling people as they tried to get out. And you know, it's very similar to what you say on the movie, The Titanic. In the end, 32 passengers and crew die. Now, 20 months later, the heavily damaged Concordia is about to be removed from her watery grave. In one of the most audacious and dangerous salvage operations ever attempted, the world's top engineers attempt to raise a ship larger than the Titanic and then float her away. This is the exclusive inside story of one of the greatest engineering challenges of our time. Raising the wreck of the Costa Concordia. Nine a.m. The salvage of the Costa Concordia is at a critical moment. Zero nine hundred hours. Okay, we're going up 10%. After over 18 months of work, the time to roll the heavily damaged ship upright arrives. No one knows how long it will take. And there are dozens of things that could go disastrously wrong. When we pull this thing around, we're going to create a lot of stresses on the ship. It's just a very critical moment of the project. There's no plan B. The weakened ship could break apart at any moment. Yeah, just confirm all personnel of the Concordia. But for lead engineer Nick Sloan, there is no turning back. No one knows how heavy the ship is. Within the first two hours, we'll know where we are. Most people will be a bit nervous. Slowly, the cables are tightened. They are pulling with a force of 6,800 tons. But an hour and a half into the operation, the ship has not budged. Getting to this moment required engineers to push the limits of their technological capability. When she was first wrecked, the ship lay vulnerable on the rocks. Now, she's covered in thousands of tons of equipment. Massive flotation chambers have been welded to her exposed side. The plan is to roll her upright onto a giant underwater steel platform. Then they will attach more flotation chambers and float her to the surface. If all goes well, Concordia will eventually be towed away and scrapped. Today is make or break. Will this daring plan actually work? Concordia's journey to this day began more than a year and a half earlier. On Friday, January 13th, 2012, she set sail from a port near Rome, Italy. With over 4,000 people on board, she's one of the world's biggest luxury cruise ships. She has an 800-seat theater, four swimming pools, and her own casino. On board, Newlyweds David and Denise Saba look forward to the trip of a lifetime. I thought this is gonna be so romantic for a honeymoon and Denise is gonna just fall in love with Europe. It was going to be a very romantic trip. Two and a half hours into the voyage, Concordia heads for the island of Giglio. The plan is to sweep close to the island 
to give passengers a scenic and dramatic thrill. Traveling at 18 miles an hour, the ship plows into rocks and rips open like a tin can. Passengers have no idea what is going on. Everything started shaking. Then a very strong vibration, like ta 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 ta. The ship starts to tilt to one side, and I take out my camera, I start filming. Passengers' video shows the terrifying scene on board. The engines are flooded. Without power, Concordia drifts a mile and a half out to sea. The scene on board is chaos. People scramble for lifeboats. Then, winds start to push Concordia back towards the island. Concordia slams into rocks a second time and finally comes to a rest. The honeymooners David and Denise Saba make it to a lifeboat, but they are far from safe. It detached, but we all fell towards one side and everybody was screaming. <laughs> fell very, very violently. And that was the moment that we thought we were gonna die. Suddenly we heard the splash. And that splash was amazing because uh, we knew we were, we were safe. As water floods in, Georgia and Dean Ananias from Los Angeles are trapped inside with their two daughters they see no way out. It's very, very scary to think, okay, now I know I'm going to die. We just came out in prayer. We said our goodbyes. That's when a ladder appeared out of nowhere. When that ladder went down, people started screaming. People pushed other people. People were going to die before they got up the ladder. Yep. It, was, it was. It was pandemonium. The Italian Coast Guard struggles to locate the stricken vessel. Infrared cameras search the dark. Nothing. They are shocked at what they find. With other passengers, the Ananias family climb the ladder and emerge on the upturned hull. They now face a treacherous climb down the side to the lifeboats. We hauled a very thin rope to hoist ourselves down the entire side of the ship. If one person slipped, one person made one wrong move, that could be the death of everybody. As they reach the waterline, the family faces a heart-stopping jump. The lifeboats are bouncing up and down, and you had the time it to jump on it. At that point, I saw people on the lifeboat. I knew I needed to get there, and you know my family needed to get there, and I needed to do what I had to do, and I just went for it. They leap into the lifeboat and head for shore. Their five and a half hour ordeal is finally over. All night, lifeboats frantically ferry survivors and casualties to the tiny harbor. Dawn, the next morning, reveals the full scale of the horror. The massive rock she hit, still embedded in her side. 
divers search for missing bodies. This is one of the largest passenger ship disasters since the Titanic. As the authorities start looking for answers, Concordia's owners have a more immediate question. What to do with the ship herself? They turn to Titan Marine. Based in Florida, this outfit has carried out many daring wreck removals. But the Concordia is a whole different ball game. For me to come here on the largest wreck removal in history, that's just the greatest thing in the world. Titan hires international salvage expert Nick Sloan to run the operation. And then uh, we'll send the Boventure back out to the Mac and uh, she's got one generator for deployment. Okay. Sloan has run big operations before, but he is amazed by the scale of this job. In terms of the size of this operation, you could take all the other salvage operations I've been involved in, times them by 10, and then this is what you got in the Custom Cordia. It's the biggest salvage operation by a long way. His dive team gets to work assessing the wreck. They make a critical discovery. Concordia lies on the edge of a steep underwater cliff and could go crashing 350 feet to the seafloor below. Basically, when that size ship starts moving, you can't stop it. If she slipped or rolled, she's gone. The team must now try to stop another catastrophe. It's two hours into the largest and most daring salvage operation ever attempted. Right now, Concordia is under immense stress. In the control room, the salvage team monitors the progress. The entire ship must expand slightly before she begins to roll upright. Finally, rusted sections of the hull start to emerge. It's a small victory, but the team is thankful the salvaging is on track. Twenty months earlier, the Concordia was in an even more precarious position. Sitting on a steep slope, she could slip at any moment. Somehow, the salvage team had to keep her from falling to the bottom of the ocean. Time is always the enemy. You know, sometimes it's one day and you lose the ship. The team must think fast. They come up with an audacious plan. 16 steel cables will be attached to the wreck's left side. Next, divers will attempt to run these cables under the ship and secure them to four massive anchor blocks drilled 50 feet into the rock-hard granite beneath. We had to cut into the granite. That's for the jackhammers, excavators, cutting machines. And of course, there's been granite that destroyed a lot of the equipment quite quickly. So we had to have spare parts coming in every week, changing out parts that should last a year. This is dangerous work. At any moment, Concordia's bulk could slip, crushing the divers underneath. It's a struggle. But finally, they get the steel cables under the ship and attached to the anchoring points. These connections can withstand many thousands of tons, which should be enough to keep the ship from moving. The celebration is short-lived. The divers identify another critical problem. 
Concordia is resting on just two rocky outcrops, one at the front and one at the back. Her vast midsection is unsupported, putting immense strain on her hull. She's like a bridge spanning the gap between the rocks, a stress she was never designed to take. Because the rack is resting on these two pinnacles, this was very dangerous for the vessel. She could break open at any moment. Over time, with the winter storms going past, the ship is bending and flexing. The sheer weight should have uh, caused it to break up. Their solution is to fill the gap between the rock and the hull with 5,000 tons of concrete grout, pumped into huge bags. The operation is so big, they bring in their own floating cement factory and anchor it right in front of the Concordia. We're going to put 16 to 18,000 tons of cement into bags that the divers go down and place on the seabed in the valley between where she's resting. So far, we've done almost 13,000 individual dives. While the ship is secured, the salvage team is hard at work. They need to come up with a plan to safely remove the ship. They come up with some ingenious solutions. We come up with a plan called the anti-plan, which is sinking a very large barge underneath the ship and rolling the ship onto the barge and then refloating the barge. We had an idea called the Chinese fan, which was essentially a, a huge custom-made accordion-like thing that we'd inflate underneath the ship and push it upright. And, you know, these things are great. And you go out and you have drinks and you get excited. I finally, yeah, you know, it's an aha moment. And then you do the math and figure out that it's not going to work. So then you back to the drawing board. Normally, they would cut up the ship. But with the Concordia, standard practice does not apply. The ship is full of potentially hazardous, decomposing materials. Tons of rotting food is on board, locked in freezers. Over 17,000 pounds of beef alone. Floating around inside are all the furnishings, bedding, and passengers' belongings. Releasing such toxic matter into this pristine place would cause a political storm and an ecological nightmare. The plan they ultimately decide on has to take into account all of these considerations. The steel platform is key to the whole concept, giving them a false seabed onto which they will roll the ship. Using hydraulic jacks, generating up to 11,000 tons of pulling force on the cables, they will rotate the ship and drag it onto the platform, a process known as par buckling. Then, the 30 huge flotation chambers will be attached to the ship and pumped dry of water, causing the giant vessel to float. If she survives this operation, Concordia will leave the island with her toxic contents still intact. It's a safe plan. It's a fast plan. It's a plan that leave this beautiful, beautiful place pretty much as we found it. The plan is daring and potentially dangerous. Since salvaging a wreck this big has never been attempted before, it's a trip into the unknown. It is an unconventional idea, completely new, unproven, because there is not a, a, a previous experience. We had to assess everything from scratch. It demands complex engineering on an unprecedented scale. We had to design, fabricate, and install 35,000 tons of steel which is five times the weight of the Eiffel Tower. A tremendous engineering effort. But there are several unknown factors. There is a possibility that the rocks penetrated the submerged superstructure. Concordia could be pinned. If it's a smooth rock, it's OK. But if there's a couple of pinnacles that she sits on, we have to tear it off that. So you have those different unknown factors. When the power bucket is finished, that's the first time we'll actually know what we're dealing with. 11.35 a.m. on the biggest day of Nick Sloan's career. Concordia is rising. 
But will she slide cleanly off the rocks? Or will she be torn apart in the process? The salvage team can only watch and wait and hope the huge wreck stays in one piece. Twenty months after crashing into the island of Giglio, Concordia is once again making headlines. Her salvage is a global news event. Thank you. News teams from around the world report minute by minute as the drama unfolds. In the control room, Nick Sloan and his team wait nervously. Progress is painfully slow. After seven hours, Concordia breaks free of the rocks. It's a huge relief. The ship continues to rise. Something they weren't sure was possible just 12 months earlier. Back in March, the team faces a different kind of challenge. After nearly 12 months' work, it's time to install the massive steel platform needed to support Concordia as she's being rolled. If you look at the profile of Zelia, this carries on to 100 meters water depth. So if she slipped or rolled, she's gone. The first challenge is drilling giant holes into the sloping granite seabed holes needed to anchor the structure. The combination of the hardness of the rock and the steep angle of the sea floor produces an almost insurmountable engineering problem. You can imagine using a hand drill on a plane of glass at 45 degrees, it just slides down. You know, we had that same problem with the drill, but kicking off the side of the mountain. It would hit the granite and it just bounces off. The first hole took six weeks. The first two months of winter were a nightmare. One by one, the holes, six feet in diameter, are drilled. 26 huge steel piles are inserted. Then, these enormous custom-made steel structures arrive. Together, they support Concordia's 60,000-ton weight. The three biggest components measure 130 feet across and weigh 1,000 tons. Then, the M30, one of the few floating cranes on the planet capable of lifting such a massive weight, lowers the platforms into place with inch-perfect accuracy. All in all, they're about one and a half times the size of a football field. Each one of those platforms is like a three-year project in the offshore industry. So we've got six of them designed, fabricated, delivered, and stored in eight and a half months. Another 13,000 tons of concrete in bags levels off the gap between her hull and the platforms. Six months after the wreck, Concordia's design presents an endless stream of challenges for the team. It is the first time that we are attempting to recover a vessel of this size in a single piece, particularly a passenger vessel, which is a delicate beast. Built for luxury cruising, Concordia's upper decks are made of lightweight aluminum and glass. Ideal for creating bright, extravagant spaces, they provide very little structural support. One thing about a passenger ship is they don't have the same strength as a uh, oil carrier or a bulk carrier. Everything above deck five is lighter and lighter and lighter. Concordia's honeycomb of unsupported interior spaces was once her greatest strength. But lying on her side, they are now her biggest weakness. Her own colossal weight is crushing her. She's already 10 feet narrower than when she was afloat. The shell of the wreck has been severely damaged by the accident and has not been designed to stay laying on its side. So it's particularly weak. It's now June 2013. 
the team is ready to install the huge flotation tanks, called sponsons, on the ship's exposed side. They're each as big as a large building and weigh 500 tons. They're the key to raising Concordia. There are 15 of them on each side, and one of these is a very, very big. It is a, a 10-story building. The crane ship Svenja arrives to delicately lower the enormous sponsons into place. 11 of them have to be attached to the exposed left side. They are welded onto Concordia's heavyweight steel hull, avoiding her fragile upper decks. So you've got a ship that has, from the top to the keel of that length, but you can only use this part for putting it upright. You've got a lot of leverage just on this part. That's why the sponsons are only welded on the lower part, even though they're 7 and 11 stories high. They're not touching the ship at that height. Once Concordia finally starts to rise, the sponsons will act as ballast. As the ship begins to be pulled upright, they'll stop it from rotating too quickly. Then their weight will help settle Concordia into position. The sponsor are not simply tanks. They are sophisticated pieces of engineering. They are divided in compartments. Each compartment can be flooded and the water can be removed. Each sponsor has got a number of valves to operate them. Each tank can be controlled individually. So you've got a lot of tanks here that you can play with to actually control the buoyancy once it comes over. Once the ship is upright, the sponsons' role changes dramatically, from providing ballast to providing buoyancy. Another 15 sponsons will be attached to the right side of Concordia and the water pumped out. The sponsons serve as huge flotation chambers capable of refloating the Concordia. Each of them are providing 3,000 tons of buoyancy to refloat the wreck. The additional sponsons are needed at the front and rear to refloat her. But this is precisely where Concordia is weakest. The added weight could cause the front or rear to shear off. We don't want to put any more weights on her because she's damaged, so we're going to clip them on afterwards. Then, the team discovers yet another potential problem. Concordia's bow juts out from the rock by almost 200 feet with no support. It's getting weaker, and it could snap off at any moment, putting the whole project in jeopardy. It's June 2013, three months before the team will attempt the impossible to roll Concordia upright, then float her away intact. Now, they suddenly face a new unexpected threat, a bow unsupported and sticking out 200 feet that could snap off at any moment. Nick Sloan and his team come up with another radical solution. It's ingenious, ambitious, and monumental. When you get around there, it's even bigger than you think. You can see the people working on top of like that. It's a mega flotation device known as a blister tank. It will cradle Concordia's bow like a neck brace. It's like the cervical collar that's going around the injured patient's neck, and she's gonna go around the bow of the Concordia, stabilize the neck, and you get rid of all the spinal complications. Built in the same Italian shipyard as Concordia, the blister tanks are precisely engineered to fit her bow like a glove. The bow will fit right through here, and then the flare of the bow will be held by the profiles all the way on top. The tanks weigh over 1,500 tons and tower 60 feet high. The world's most powerful crane ship, the Svenja, is needed to drop them into place. 
There's not many crane barges around that can just do a 1,500 ton lift and put it down within a meter accuracy of where you want it. State-of-the-art GPS technology keeps Venya perfectly positioned as the blister tanks are hoisted into place. She's got dynamic positioning capability. She uses satellites, she uses a, a wire to the seabed, and she can maintain her position within 20 centimeters while she's doing that lift. The blister tanks are flooded, positioned under Concordia's bow, and attached using giant steel pins. The installation and the construction of the, of the blister tank is already maybe the most difficult uh, thing to do in this project. Finally, Concordia's steel life jacket is in place. To take something out that is this weak in one piece, that's really the mega problem here, right? So uh, all of these other things, designing the platforms, the drilling into the seabed to put the platforms in place, the uh, mounting of the sponsons on the hull, the blister tank uh, themselves, the blisters would be a major project. So uh, all of these things have been uh, huge engineering challenges that we've met and overcome. The last piece of the engineering puzzle is how to generate the force needed to pull a ship as big as Concordia off the rocks. The answer lies in these red machines welded to the top of the ship. They are hydraulic cable pulling machines called strand jacks. The cables are fed through the underside of the jack and emerge from the top. A hydraulic piston grips the cable and pulls it with a force of 500 tons. It has a, a tube that comes down, it grabs onto the wire, it brings it back in a stroke of about 400 millimeters, comes back, picks up another load, you release the anchor and it takes another 400 millimeters. So it can do about three and a half meters per hour at the maximum load. Very stronger than the biggest tug in the world. Trenjex can move very, very slowly, but with a great force and a great control. The cables from the first set of strand jacks run under the wreck and attach to the left side of the ship. The jacks are housed in specially constructed towers built between the ship and the shoreline. Inshore, you've got 22 strand jacks. They 500 ton capacity each, so there's 11,000 tons of holdback. If she slid the half a meter, you'd do so much damage because of the forces. The second set of strand jacks are welded to the flotation tanks, their cables attached to the steel platform under the wreck. During the raising of the ship, the two sets of strand jacks work together, one to rotate the ship, the other to keep her position. We've got to keep her as steady as possible. It's almost like rotating a ruler on a very slippery bit of ice. If you try and rotate it without holding the one side, it's just going to slide down. 5 p.m., eight hours into the salvage, things seem to be progressing well. The strand jacks seem to be doing their job. Concordia has risen 10 degrees, but then everything stops. For salvage master Nick Sloan, the man in charge of raising the biggest shipwreck of modern times, it's already been a long day. He left his hotel at 5 a.m. and is mobbed by the press who want to know how it feels to attempt something this big. Next, he boards a boat for the operations control room, located on a barge directly in front of Concordia. At 9 a.m., he checks that there is no one on board the Concordia itself. Now, he begins to pull the ship upright. Okay, we're going up 10%. But now, eight hours in, there is a problem. Right. 
Everything stops. A rapid response team needs a closer look. Some of the powerful steel cables pulling the ship up are in danger of tangling. The team must work fast. They're specially trained in climbing techniques so they can cope with the sloping hull. to fix the problem. But an hour of precious daylight is lost. Now, they must work through the night. The operation to pull the ship upright began nine hours ago. Now, the process reaches another critical phase. As we're starting to rotate it, we're putting a lot of pressure on the starboard bilge, the starboard lower corner of the ship. And uh, that could start to collapse. And when that collapses, what that does is it changes the pivot point of the ship. And it can get, you know, you could get to a point where you, you might not be able to pivot it anymore. So that's one, one, one serious problem. As the hours pass, Concordia continues inching up. Everything seems to be working as planned. The ship's hull appears to be strong enough to take the massive forces. The salvage team has been under pressure for 15 hours. Midnight comes and goes. Work goes deep into the night. Concordia's rotated about 25 degrees. Another critical moment looms. The ship starts to rotate under her own weight. The forces are falling off. The ship wants to start to come over by itself. And that's where we start the uh, complex ballasting of the, uh, of the tanks to uh, start to bring it over. And then there's a final uh, settle down period where we, we do the final ballasting and, and actually gently set it onto the platforms. The power of the strand jacks is no longer needed. By 2 a.m., Concordia has rotated another 10 degrees. It has taken 17 hours. The salvage team must continue to wait. It's too soon to know if this will actually work. It's now 2.30 a.m. More than 17 hours after starting, the Costa Concordia is almost upright. The danger now is that the ship will over-rotate. But the giant sponsons on the left-hand side are stabilizing the ship just as planned. Finally, just before 4 a.m., Concordia is raised. Now, the huge steel platform is bearing the full weight of the stricken liner. the salvage team's ships sound their horns in celebration. Elated and relieved, Nick Sloan and Richard Habib 
step off the boat and into a hero's welcome. There's been no gas, there's been no uh, pollution. It's, uh, she's completely upright. Dawn brings astonishing shots of the damage to Concordia's right-hand side. The damage where she rested on the two pinnacles of rock clearly visible. Curtains, luggage, all kinds of debris clearly seen. Now that Concordia is upright, the hardest part of the salvage operation is complete. But there are many more challenges to come. Next year, the team will fix new flotation tanks on her right side. Pumping out the tanks will take weeks, and the ship will finally float once more. Towing her away will be a very slow process. They will travel at just two miles per hour, putting minimal stress on the ship. Only when the cruise liner is finally cut up and scrapped will Nick Sloan and his team have accomplished their Herculean task.